Hello, and thank you for watching part 3 of this series, where we will continue our study into the reasons for having so much contention between Christians when it comes to understanding the Word of God. Even though we all read the same Holy Spirit-inspired book, we often arrive at completely opposing understandings that lead to division, arguments, and people even unfriending fellow brothers and sisters on social media. This is specifically notable when we compare notes on our understanding of what is known as the first resurrection. In the previous video, we looked at the defining attributes of the first resurrection, and you will recall that the primary attributes were given to us in Hebrews 11 verse 1 and 2, and that being having faith in Jesus for being the Son of God who came to the earth to die in our place for the removal of our sins. Second to this, we have seen that the people that are described in Hebrews 11 do not come from a specific nation or people group and can be accurately referred to as Jews and Gentiles without contradicting the Word of God. Today we will look at some of the differences between the main harvest and the gleanings of God's first resurrection harvest and highlight some instances in which the Word of God points out the differences between these two groups. If this is the first video in the series that you have watched, please stop the video now and start with part 1, for which a link can be found in the description below. We will be discussing information in this video that will be built on the foundation that we have established up to this point, and if you do not watch the first two videos in sequence, it may be difficult to follow or understand the explanation given today. Some of the aspects that we will cover today include the following. Why is it important to consider all of God's Word and not just certain sections when studying Scripture? Where does the Bible point us to the separation between God's main harvest and the gleanings? What are the attributes that differentiate the main harvest from the gleanings? Which additional models and symbols do we need to consider that provide us with a foundation for understanding? What are some of the differences between the dispensations to which each section of the first resurrection harvest belong? Jesus explains to his disciples that doing the works of God is to have faith in the Son whom the Father sent. This is exactly what the elders received a good report for in Hebrews 11, when we link it to Jesus' words to his disciples. We also have to consider that during the times when the elders lived on earth, the gospel of salvation through faith was not yet available. Keep this in mind for later. In the book of Revelation, we also see that faith is once again highlighted in Jesus' evaluation of each of the churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 pointing out to them that they are evaluated on the measure of faith they had in Jesus. To each of the churches, Jesus promises a reward to those members that are able to overcome. But as we have now seen, no definition is given to us in the book of Revelation to obtain a sure understanding of what it means to overcome. At this point, we know that we have to apply Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10 to our reading of Scripture, in order to obtain a proper understanding of subjects in the Word of God, and that our Heavenly Father would have left the answer to a question in one passage, somewhere else in another passage also found in the same amazing book. Let us quickly refresh our memories regarding the primary attributes of the first resurrection, and see how this then ties in with Jesus' evaluation of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. These three passages are essential in our understanding of how God views and measures the first resurrection, and those that belong to it, and also to give us understanding of how the different harvest sections are delineated. Also, note how living a sinless life is not part of what it means to overcome the world, neither is it part of God's works or having faith in Jesus. In the times leading up to putting these videos together, the Lord normally sends me a number of issues that would seem to fit in with what I will be discussing in the next video, and as such I would like to address some of these as we continue. My intention is not to be contentious, but to point out the dangers and pitfalls 
of adopting views regarding the Word of God in which several passages are violated by that view, and how we would fall back into a position of ignorance by adopting certain views. Here is an example. Some would say that when we read certain sections of the Word of God, that those sections were not written for believers in Jesus, but that they were written and only intended for the nation of Israel, for instance. Now, while I completely agree with the understanding that specific books were written with a focus on intended audiences, such as the nation of Israel, or the church of Ephesus, or a person such as Philemon, would we benefit in any way from discarding or ignoring some of what is written in Scripture, just because of this fact? I mean, why would our Heavenly Father include a letter that is addressed to Philemon to become part of His word to us, if the letter was only intended for that person, and if God's intention was for us to ignore what was written in it? Would it be wise to adopt an approach of asking, Is what I am reading really intended for me, in light of the following three passages? All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. When we combine the information in these three passages, we see that God intends for us to look at the entire volume of His Word in order to discover precepts that He hid for us in His Word and to receive proper understanding even if the audience that was addressed may not conform to the one that we find ourselves in today, such as the church. The Word of God has many layers to it, and while the narrative may seem to have a specific focus, there are many deeper layers that are completely blind to the audience that is being addressed. I would like to give an example of how such an approach, where information provided in the Word of God is considered only to be intended for Israel, could be completely misguided. One parable that some would say is intended only for Israel is that of the ten virgins. This parable was given by Jesus to the nation of Israel while he was preaching among them, and was recorded in the Gospel of Matthew that has a very specific focus on Israel as well. Some would say that Jesus was not talking to the church in this parable, and that this was intended just for the Jews. Is this assumption true when we consider all aspects and the layers that exist in God's word? And is this a safe approach to adopt when trying to understand the Word of God? What about the Old Testament? This was also intended for Israel in its entirety. But what would we miss if we abandoned the entire Old Testament because it was not specifically intended for the Gentiles? Two issues that we would face just in this study that we have done up to now is that we would not know how to approach the Word of God properly, as explained in Isaiah 28, and we would have no idea of the temple or harvest models as explained in Exodus and Leviticus that are required to make sense of what is written in Revelation, to understand what is said about the first resurrection. Remember that God wants us to study His Word from beginning to end, to receive understanding and wisdom, and to do this, we have to consider more than just one passage when we look for answers. A specific example that I would like to point out in the parable of the ten virgins concerns the conversation between the bridegroom and the five virgins who had no extra oil, who asked to be allowed into the marriage after the door was shut. This is what is written. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Do you not find that the conversation between the five foolish virgins and the bridegroom is somewhat vague? Why were the five foolish virgins not allowed into the marriage, and why did the bridegroom not know them, even though they went out with the five wise virgins to meet the bridegroom? Remember now that our Heavenly Father does not provide us with everything we need to know about this encounter in this passage alone, and more of what we need to understand about this parable is given to us elsewhere in Scripture. Looking at the exchange between the bridegroom and the five foolish virgins in this passage, 
there is not sufficient information provided to discover who exactly the five foolish virgins are, or what specific attributes define them, except for the lack of oil. From the first impressions that we get, it would seem that they are unbelievers, given that the bridegroom points out a non-existing relationship between him and them. Looking at this parable in isolation, it could very well seem to point to Israel who have rejected their Messiah, and who do not have a relationship with him currently. However, we have now realized that we should expect to encounter insufficient information if we consider a single passage in the Word of God in isolation, and we have to search the scriptures for a little more information about the five foolish virgins that will be provided elsewhere as explained and promised to us in Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10. So where do we find this information? Look specifically at what the five foolish virgins said to the bridegroom, as this gives us the connection to another passage where we are provided with the additional detail that we are after. They said, Lord, Lord, open to us, or Lord, Lord, let us in. And the bridegroom's response was, I know you not. These are two links or two connectors that we have to follow to other parts of scripture where we can obtain deeper insight. This same request by the five foolish virgins is linked to another passage where exactly the same situation is addressed in the same book of Matthew as well. So apparently everything is focused on Israel, but is it truly? Let us see what we read in Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Just as explained to us in the parable of the ten virgins, these people are requesting entry into the kingdom of God by saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. And Jesus then responding to them with, I never knew you. However, in this section, Jesus expounds on what else is said in the conversation so that we can better understand who the five foolish virgins are, why they were not allowed to enter into the marriage with those who had taken extra oil with them, and also why the bridegroom said that he did not know them, and what they did wrong. It is clear that those who are asking the Lord for entry into the kingdom after the door is shut knew him, given that they mentioned the works that they have done in his name. How do we find out then who these people are? Well, we can apply simple logic together with a process of elimination, and compare what is written in the word of God to the aspects that are mentioned in this conversation to find the answer. First, let us look at how unbelievers, or the unsaved, would fit in with what is said. Would unbelievers expect the bridegroom to return, and would they go out to meet him, as we see explained in the first verse of the parable of the ten virgins? Most unbelievers would scoff and mock at people who believe that there is a bridegroom in the first place, and who are expecting the return of the Son of God to the earth. Also, in what this group says to the bridegroom, when they ask him for entry into the marriage, the reasons they offer are far removed from those who are unbelievers. Unbelievers will have no authority to cast out demons, and will in fact themselves be hosts to demons. They will also not prophesy in the name of Jesus, as this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, as explained to us in 1 Corinthians 12, which those who do not believe in Jesus cannot receive. Unbelievers who prophesy are judged by the word of God, because that practice is called divination. These two aspects mentioned by those who are seeking entry into the kingdom of God show us that this group cannot be representing unbelievers. What about the Jews then? Similar to the unbelievers, Israel as a nation has rejected the bridegroom since the first advent. Israel is not casting out demons or prophesying in the name of Jesus, as there is a specific condition imposed on them for their rejection of their Messiah that is also very important to note, as this has to do with the separation of harvests. This is that they are blinded to the identity of the bridegroom until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Given what is written in Romans 11, Israel would not be in a position to know who the bridegroom is while there are Gentiles left on the earth 
who have the attributes of the first resurrection, which is faith in Jesus as being the Son of God, and including people from all nations on earth. Look at this from another perspective. What event would mark the fullness of the Gentiles in light of what we have considered thus far, and if we seek to avoid contradicting the word of God? Would it not be the completion of the first resurrection? Would it not require all three parts of God's faith harvest to be reaped and for all three parts of the temple to be completed before one could say that the fullness of the Gentiles had been achieved? If we say that the fullness of the Gentiles had been achieved and there remains another person to be saved through faith in Jesus, how can that view then be called the fullness of the Gentiles? The Bible clearly tells us that Israel will only be allowed to recognize their Messiah once there is nobody left on earth who could still come to salvation through faith in Christ. This understanding is very well supported by Scripture, which we will get to in a future video. Keep this in mind as we continue. Let us look for more supporting evidence. Think again about the assumption that the focus of the parable of the ten virgins is on the nation of Israel specifically, and then, in light of this additional information, ask the following question. Where in the Bible do we find examples of where Israel prophesied in the name of Jesus and cast out demons after Jesus spoke the words in Matthew 7? Corporately, we know that the nation of Israel has for 2,000 years rejected their Messiah, and as such would not be prophesying in his name. Neither have they cast out demons, except for those who became part of the church. The Bible even gives us an example where unbelieving Jews attempted to do what the five foolish virgins were offering the bridegroom as proof of their worthiness to gain entry into the kingdom of God. These Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, neither did they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now we begin to see that Jesus, in Matthew 7, was clearly talking about a situation that has never been associated with Israel as a nation since he came to the earth as the suffering servant. Israel as a nation rejected their Messiah, and since Jesus' death and resurrection, has never been in a position to offer the Lord what the five foolish virgins were offering him. So this conversation between the bridegroom and the five foolish virgins can therefore not represent a discussion between the bridegroom and Israel, if we want our understanding not to contradict what the word of God says, and while we apply Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10. Having just one option left, these then have to be believers in Jesus Christ that are pleading with the Lord to be let into the marriage. Now, Many will say that it is preposterous to make such a statement, and that I am throwing context out the door, but all that I am doing is to read what the Word of God says, using and applying the models that He provided us for our reading of Scripture, and to share with you what I see. I am simply looking for an understanding that does not contradict what is written in the Word of God. It is only preposterous if we draw our conclusions from reading sections of the Bible in isolation from others, without looking at what the rest of God's word has to say about a subject, when he instructs us to read his word from cover to cover. We know that a harvest consists of the same grain for all three parts of the harvest, and this understanding also lines up accurately with both the temple and harvest models. These people claim to have cast out demons and to have prophesied in the name of the Lord. Only believers in Christ, or people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, would be in a position to cast out demons and to prophesy in the name of Jesus. Here is more evidence from the Word of God to support this understanding. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Also note what Paul writes in the following passage. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Both the gift of prophecy and the authority to cast out demons 
are gifts of the Holy Spirit to believers in Christ, further supporting what we are discovering. Can you see the risk of avoiding certain scriptures just because it would seem to be addressing a specific group of people? These are some of the pitfalls we need to consider and avoid as we study God's word. So what is the parable of the ten virgins telling us in light of the harvest and temple models? When we study the harvest, the parable of the ten virgins actually fits in perfectly with the description of the remainder of the harvest that is seen in the field after the first fruits have been removed. This also fits in with a promise that Jesus made to those who were left behind on earth when he ascended to heaven after his resurrection to present the first fruits before the throne of God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is what a Jewish bridegroom would do before his wedding. After the marriage contract is signed, the bridegroom would leave his bride-to-be behind while he goes back to his father's house to prepare a place where he and his bride would live and once this is ready, he would return and collect his bride and take her with him to his father's house. There are also several models in the Bible of a Jewish bridegroom who marries a Gentile bride whose death is then never recorded, providing us with a model of a Gentile bride who has received everlasting life. This parable is then a good starting point for identifying the differences between the main harvest and the gleanings of God's harvest. We can clearly see that the remainder of the harvest, after the first fruits were presented to God in heaven, are associated with the ten virgins that are mentioned at the start of this parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The parable starts off by pointing out a single group without any initial indication of a division that exists, just as one would not see a division in the remainder of the harvest once the first fruits are removed. The division that will separate the remainder of the harvest into two only occurs at the time when the main harvest is reaped, and only becomes evident at the time of this harvest, while it also provides reasons for the division as the parable progresses. There is another passage in which the model of the harvest is linked to the return of the bridegroom without clearly showing the division that will occur at the end. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. As we've discussed in the previous two videos, Paul's explanation here highlights the fact that the harvest model applies and requires our consideration in order to understand the first resurrection. However, the passage itself does not specifically explain the harvest model to us and mentions only a single group at the return of Christ at the end. Having a single group that will be resurrected at Christ's return does not line up with what we are shown in Leviticus. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. If we concluded that there would only be a firstfruits resurrection and a main harvest event that would empty the rest of the field in a single action, our understanding would contradict the pattern that is provided to us in the Word of God. The very next verse in the parable of the ten virgins points out the division that exists in the group that started off as a single group of ten. And just as with a harvest, after the first fruits are reaped, the field would seem to represent a single group of grain that remains. A division awaits the remaining crop only when the next section is removed, leaving only the corners of the field still standing. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Here we are given specific symbols that allow us to search the scripture for understanding of what is being conveyed to the reader. And what is very interesting is how the information provided is once again clearly linked to the temple model. When God instructed Israel to build his tabernacle, which is an earthly representation of the heavenly temple, 
we see that the lamps and the oil for light are associated with the holy place of the temple, or the main harvest of the crop. A very detailed description of the seven lamp candlestick, otherwise known as the menorah, is provided in Exodus 25, showing us clearly where this is positioned in God's temple. However, let us look at some passages that address the lamps and the oil, as mentioned in the parable of the ten virgins, and see what we can learn. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. The candlestick also for the light, and his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light. From these we are shown that the candlestick is positioned in the holy place, which is outside the veil or outside the most holy place of God's temple, and that God's desire and purpose for the lamps are to give light without interruption, and it requires a continuous supply of oil to do so. In God's temple there never exists a situation in which all the lamps of the candlestick are not burning, or where there is a shortage of oil. This aspect clearly differentiates the foolish from the wise virgins, where we read the following. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The foolish virgins represent a candlestick without oil and therefore not giving light as intended. They would therefore fail to meet God's purpose and desire for them, according to the model provided in Exodus. This is further expounded on by Jesus when he explained in detail who would be blessed in the kingdom of God and how they are represented on earth. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. At this point I would like to jump to Revelation chapters 2 and 3, to see how what is said to some of the churches tie in with what is written in the parable of the ten virgins. We know that when Jesus evaluates the seven churches, he points out positive and negative aspects to the churches as they are being evaluated. They are also each given a promise of reward for overcoming, and some are warned of the consequences for not overcoming and for staying on the path that they are currently on. This evaluation would seem to be made at the point where the main harvest had not yet occurred, but where it is just about to occur, and each church is given an evaluation of their position in the field, that would determine the final outcome of where they would be positioned in the temple of God once the main harvest is removed. Some of these churches would seem to be positioned in only the main harvest, like the Church of Philadelphia, while most would seem to cross over from the main harvest into the gleanings. One church which would seem to be situated only in the gleanings of the harvest is Smyrna, which is instructed to remain faithful unto death, an attribute which is exclusively associated with the gleanings of God's harvest. We see the foolish virgins' problem once again pointed out when Jesus evaluates the church of Ephesus. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Why would a candlestick or lamp be associated with this evaluation process and be at risk of being removed from the temple? From what the Word of God shows us, this would only happen if the candlestick failed to serve its purpose of giving light, which would once again point to a lack of oil. What is given as the reason for the church's position to be removed from its position in the holy place of God's temple? This flaw is pointed out by Jesus as leaving their first love. How does this tie in with what we see in the parable of the ten virgins? We discover this when we look at the detail of the conversation between the bridegroom and the foolish virgins as given to us in Matthew 7. 
Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful... The first aspect that can be pointed out is that the five foolish virgins had nothing to say about what Jesus did for them, that he laid down his life for them so that they, through faith in his atoning blood, could receive a position of honor in the temple of God. They had no adoration for him, they gave him no honor, and they were completely focused on their own works and on what they did for him. Their relationship would seem to be void of intimacy with the bridegroom. They believed that Jesus is the Son of God and have as a result qualified for salvation and have also received spiritual gifts and authority over Satan which they then offer as the evidence for being worthy to enter God's kingdom and just as the wise virgins they expected the return of the bridegroom. The fact that they were not allowed to enter into the marriage does not mean that they are necessarily lost after their conversation with the bridegroom. There are, however, a passage that links the rewards that these believers will receive with that of the unbelievers. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Also keep this in mind as we continue. We are dealing here with two remaining portions of the first resurrection harvest, with the attributes of having faith in Jesus first, and secondly, having people of all nations, Jews and Gentiles, as part of this harvest. When we consider the ten virgins to be a representation of the remainder of God's faith harvest, or the first resurrection, and representing the remainder of the heavenly temple that awaits completion, we know that this group of ten has to be split into two sections in order to complete the holy place in God's temple when the main harvest is reaped and leaving the gleanings of the harvest to the poor that will finally become the outer court of God's temple once the poor has worked through the field as they glean. Can we find any further supporting evidence for this understanding in this parable? And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. This passage shows us that the wise went into a building, and that a door was shut behind them. The foolish virgins, on the other hand, found themselves outside the building, with no way to enter after the door was shut. This perfectly matches the imagery given to us in the temple model. We see the situation further elaborated on in the next parable that follows, where a distinction is made between good and evil servants. Just as in the parable of the ten virgins, we have a group of people that are all considered servants of the Lord, but they are once again divided into good and evil servants, just as we had wise and foolish virgins. The evil or unprofitable servant situation even though he is considered a servant of the Lord or someone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, will be similar to that of the foolish virgins who found themselves outside the door and outside the building or the holy place once the door to the building is shut. We have now considered a number of attributes that are associated with the foolish virgins, but there are more to take into account, and we will continue where we leave off today in the next video. I am ending this video somewhat abruptly, but to avoid making these videos too lengthy and to allow me to post videos more often, we will end here for today. If you have found this video to be helpful in understanding what is written to us in the Word of God, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel so you can follow upcoming videos when they are uploaded. Also, I would really appreciate it if you could help me by sharing this with others so that more can receive understanding of God's Word. It would seem that very few people are interested in this kind of information, given the interest the series has received thus far. But even this is explained to us in the Word of God. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. May God bless you and keep you, and may His grace accompany you wherever you go. Until next time.